Okay, well, thanks for joining us, everybody. My name is Christine Rickabaugh. Uh, I am the Open Education Librarian at the University of Arkansas. Um, but before I was here, I was at the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee with my lovely colleagues, Marion Archer, who is an Acquisitions Librarian, and Kristen Woodward, who is the Teaching and Learning Team Lead at the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee uh, Libraries. Um, and we're talking today about interdepartmental collaboration. And so what we want to do is really just kind of show you at, at UWM um, the role of open and affordable education, um, how we developed sort of a strategy for a library wide um, textbook initiative that was affordable or no cost. Um, and then we wanted to share a little bit of our successes and our next steps. Um, and I will turn it over to Kristen. I can advance slides, but I can't advance and unmute at the same time. Sorry about that. Um, so at UW-Milwaukee, um, we have that um, sort of um, typical um, city university mission where we combine access and availability to our local community and the state with um, a heavy research emphasis as an R1 institution. Um, our enrollment right now is around 24,000. We have the largest number of veterans in the state of Wisconsin, um, and we have a very uh, large number of first-generation students. We serve students of color, and we have um, a large portion of our freshmen are coming in as Pell eligible. So um, we'll share this to kind of define the um, scene at UWM and sort of establish that um, we um, situate our uh, open and affordable textbook program in um, the situation that our students are in and the needs that they have. On our campus, we have an existing um, open textbook um, initiative and we have the support of our uh, university library through strategic planning. Um, we've highlighted the initiative to support UWM's affordable learning goals for students by promoting no or low cost library collections. Um, so this is part of our student success plan on our campus. And um, the history of incorporating open textbooks and affordable materials um, has been strong for about 10 years within our campus's strategic planning uh, within the libraries. So that's part of what we see as our organizational strengths um, as we began to develop a more cohesive open textbook and affordability project on our campus. And um, I can share that our um, overall uh, mission to support instruction and research is one of those strengths. Um, we work very closely with our faculty through our information literacy program. And we also have close relationships um, with our sort of um, small staff um, dedicated to the research support of our faculty. Within the library, our interlibrary loan and course reserves units are also providing alternatives to print and digital textbook purchases, um, making things available for checkout and assisting our faculty with um, building materials into the Canvas learning environment. Our open textbook project um, also markets efforts to reduce the cost of attendance by using free and low cost materials. And our collections and resource management unit um, was already, uh, when we started this initiative, purchasing textbooks, usually by faculty request. Um, and as I think others have mentioned today, as we moved through the pandemic, the sort of line between textbook and research materials became even a little bit more fuzzy during that time frame, as we were looking for materials to help support students and the switch to um, online learning. Uh, 
Um, so as I mentioned, the four units that came together on our team then to really focus on expanding from an open textbook and reserve and a little bit here in collections, a little bit there kind of focus consisted of course reserves, interlibrary loan, our open textbook project and CRM. Um, we developed a, a team within the library and received our charge to um, expand the offerings that we had um, for open and affordable materials, really focusing on students um, going through our general education curriculum. Since each of us was already doing something to contribute in this area, what we really wanted to do was figure out how we could make this more of a cohesive and transparent marketable project that we felt confident talking about. So to do that, we got together as a team and developed three research questions. Um, the first was to look at our campus policies and um, what we could do within the library to um, begin promoting resources and materials. So one primary example that Marion can touch on more is that our um, collection development policy for the library was pretty explicit in saying we don't purchase textbooks. Um, our interlibrary loan policy was pretty explicit in saying we don't borrow textbooks from other schools, but yet in our practices, this was kind of happening and we were seeing that there was a lot of disconnect between sort of our public service mode, what we wanted to do for students, and then what we were actually um, committed to doing in those policies. We also looked at the way that um, faculty go about um, purchasing and selecting textbooks. So one of our other questions was, does the current textbook course materials selection workflow and adoption policy accomplish transparency of course material cost with students? Are we supporting faculty through a process that makes it possible for them to put a statement in their syllabus that says, in order to choose these materials, I looked for the materials that supported the learning outcomes for this course. And I also looked for materials that were the most affordable and cost-effective um, for the student. <clears throat> we also looked at how we could recommend a workflow that would maximize our collections and OER so that we could um, best support those types of practices uh, among our faculty. Christine? And to kind of look at this and do this, we started with an internal audit. Um, so it at one point meant literally going through our website and looking at page by page all of the messages that we had about textbooks. Um, and as Kristen alluded to, we sort of had policies and then practices. And sometimes they would be literally the top paragraph saying we don't collect textbooks. And then the next paragraph saying and the administrative leadership textbooks are da 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 da. Um, so we were sending our community some really mixed messages. And so we really kind of looked at that. Um, we looked at the policies that we're going through. Uh, we were fortunate enough at that time to get a new um, head of collections who could help us kind of um, re-trigger and, and re-look at um, that policy as part of it. Um, in addition, we also did some environmental scans. So looking at what were other universities doing, how were they addressing these issues? Um, what were some of their initiatives, uh, a lot of, you know, attending these kinds of conferences and hearing about other people's ideas. Um, and so what this led to was sort of a two-pronged approach, um, creating some shared messaging. So first we looked at who needs our messages about open and affordable materials. And so we identified some specific personas, students, instructors, library staff, and then student staff, those kind of first line, you know, circulation assistants, people who the students are actually going to go to to talk to and ask about textbooks, and sort of when they needed the information, you know, what were the pain points that we were seeing, um, 
Do they know when they need to order their textbooks? Do first generation students know they're going to have to pay for textbooks? Kind of all of these questions. And then how do we get this information to those people? That was kind of prong one. Prong two was looking within the library and saying, how do we do this? How can we have a cohesive message that all of library staff understands that if someone says, I'm looking for a textbook for my chemistry course, they say, okay, you're going to start here. And then we kind of move um, from left to right, from the most open option to the least open option. So we start saying we'd like to look at open materials, open textbooks. Can we put something together for you? Can we find something within the library collection that would work? Do we need to put something on course reserve? And then do we need to get something from interlibrary loan? Um, and by bringing this team together, we had the opportunity to not only put together the workflow, but think about, you know, what are the capabilities? Can interlibrary loan handle 75 classes saying, I need materials for the first two weeks of school? you know, is that within their bandwidth or not? And so we really kind of brought all of those different stakeholders together as we continued this process. Uh, and so this led to kind of two specific outcomes. The first was our open textbook Canvas training. So we used Canvas as an LMS um, and we, Kristen and our partners over at the Center for Teaching Excellence, Center for Excellence in Teaching and Learning, um, put together a press books or a open textbook training so they could go through and learn what are open materials, where can I find them, they could kind of um, do some reviews, go through some of the repositories and really sort of understand what open materials are. The other outcome was an affordability hub, so a very specific messaging for those different personas that we identified identified and said, here are our messages. We made sure they were clear. There were ones we could follow um, that fit our existing policies, that fit how we were moving forward, and also gave really clear um, directions to the different people who might be looking for affordable textbooks. And then that moves us to Marion. So um, as has been mentioned, we got a new um, head of collection and resource management um, right around the time we were, um, well, when we were working on this project and right around the time that we were um, rewriting our collection development policy. So um, since the head recognized that we were already spending money on textbooks, um, even though it was specifically outlined that we wouldn't, um, we just excluded the no textbooks from the new collection development policy. So um, it doesn't explicitly say we buy all textbooks, but it also doesn't say we don't buy any textbooks. So that that was a, a change um, that uh, happened um, because of this, well, partially because of this um, project and partially because we had a new head. Um, library staff collaboration has increased. Um, this has been really fruitful across departments. Um, and so it's, it's been a good model um, and hopefully will lead to more cross-departmental collaboration. Um, we have a level of communication now with our bookstore eCampus um, that didn't exist before because we, um, we've reached out to them to get uh, textbook lists so we can kind of be more on top of what's being assigned. Um, and uh, e-inventory now has a course reserves identifier in Primo. Um, so part of that kind of rethinking of, of how we use our, our collections budget um, is that we embarked on a pilot project to purchase assigned text in an e-format. Um, we're kind of in the middle of that project right now, and I'll talk a little bit more about it in a minute. But due to that, um, Course Reserves didn't really put journal articles or other e-inventory. Um, they didn't add identifiers to it in our catalog. Um, and now because students have been looking for these e textbooks that we've purchased. Um, now they've added those that identifier in our um, in our catalog so uh, that can expand to other um, other types of materials that aren't just purchased for courses. Um, and we have new data sharing practices. Um, the textbook lists that are received from our bookstore um, that have course adopted texts and curated course packets 
um, access codes, all sorts of things that are assigned for classes. Um, those are shared uh, with many different departments because text assigned textbooks touches ILL, reserve, user services, just every department. Um, so those lists are shared. Um, Ebooks uh, that are requested by faculty are shared with different departments. Um, user services uses um, that those that information that used to just stay in collection resource management. Now that information is being used to calculate savings over time for students. Um, and we are um, increasing kind of the types of things that we consider course adopted texts. Um, so instead of just saying textbooks and having a traditional textbook format, we're considering films course adopted texts. Um, we're considering um, journal articles, just anything can be considered a course adopted text. It's the, the definition isn't as narrow. So by the numbers, um, OER over the past seven years has saved $3.5 million um, and touched 30,000 students um, through uh, largely through Kristen's efforts as the OER librarian uh, on staff. Um, and for this pilot project in for fall 2023 for the e-course adopted texts, um, and just briefly the what the the project consists of is that using the textbook list, we searched every single entry for every section of every class and anything that was available in an e-format um, with an unlimited user license we purchased. Um, the, there were only a couple things that were too expensive um, that we had to exclude, but for the most part, we purchased everything that was available. Um, and it ended up being uh, 144 textbooks that we purchased. And then in the course of that, we also identified 89 that we already owned in an e-format. Um, 165 instructors had their books um, available for free through the library, 279 sections of 185 courses, and um, 5,685 students. Uh, and doing the calculations on enrollment versus textbook cost, um, this has the potential to save students nearly $280,000 this semester. Um, I think I forgot one thing. Um, okay, so OER and ECATS complement each other nicely because OER is more often um, available for lower level classes, those sort of more general broad classes, um, and the ECATS were more often available for upper level classes um, because upper level classes more often don't use traditional textbooks um, or they the things that they're using might not be identified as pu by publishers as textbooks, um, or they might just not be the things that publishers are restricting so much because publishers stand to make more money on the things that are gonna be purchased by a class of 175 um, freshmen instead of 10 seniors. Um, so these two things don't really overlap or fight for attention. They actually complement each other really nicely. Um, so, our next steps, um, we are, we've given a presentation tour to campus administration, including deans, um, the difference of the different schools and colleges, chairs and directors to promote the message of textbook affordability um, need. So to, to really get that message out there, to get administration um, aware of what we're doing and, and how, how desperate the need is for it. Um, and an online ca campus training that we talked about uh, as the first step for faculty participation. Um, next step for the ECATS, since this is a semester long pilot project and we're sort of in the middle of it, right now we are composing a survey to, to send out to students um, to see if this was as useful to them as we think it would be. Um, and then uh, once we do that, we'll use usage data and those student surveys to kind of do assessment and seek out um, ongoing funding sources to continue if the assessment suggests that it uh, was useful um, budget budgetary decision. And then continuing staff engagement, um, brown bags, updates. Um, this is a new approach to, to um, textbooks that uh, is not as traditional. Um, it affects student workers, frontline staff, um, and how they triage and direct questions. So there's some training to, to be done, um, not just of, uh, all the librarians, but pretty much everybody in the library. 
And then the final slide um, is just a really nice chart uh, that Christine made of the savings over time um, for the OER implementations. So um, this is a really nice visual representation of how this has grown exponentially over the last just seven years that, that this has been tracked. And that's it. So um, here's our contact information if you have any questions um, later on. Um, and then uh, we can talk about, we can answer any questions that you have right now. We do have sure. one more uh, question in the chat that we have time for. If you wanna answer um, Anna Wong's question, how do you calculate the savings? Yeah, I was just gonna answer. Do you mind if I answer, Kristen? No, go right ahead. Okay. Um, usually we do the savings based on the commercial cost of the text. So whatever is being replaced um, times the number of students that are impacted. So uh, for example, our like big nine, big level course is psychology 101. Um, when students adopted the open um, open stacks textbook, uh, students saved $170 over that was the cost of their commercial textbook. Um, and so that's how we got, uh, you know, with a thousand students taking that each semester, that adds up pretty quickly. Great, thank you so much. We are at time. Uh, thank you all for um, sharing your information and uh, we will be sending out the slides. So you'll have this contact information as well when that is sent out to participants. Um, thank you again for joining us. And um, if you are in the next session, uh, feel free to stay. We'll be uh, talking with someone from the Creative Commons. Thanks again, everyone. <laughs>